Welcome to Staying Connected, a podcast where I talk to people about their stories with Feds, Marfan, Lowy Steeds, and related vascular and aortic connective tissue conditions. This is your host, Katie. And before we get into the show, I want to remind you that the views, information, and opinions in this podcast are those of the individuals involved, and the information presented does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. Any opinions that I express in this podcast are my own and not of my employer. Welcome back. I hope you got a lot out of the last episode with Mary Myers, sharing her daughter Adeline's story with Lowy Steed Syndrome. On today's episode, we're talking to Grace Barnhart about her story with Marfan Syndrome. A reminder before we go over to the interview, the VEDS research study by Maya Brown Zimmerman titled The Role of Community in Mental Health, a Grief and Trauma-Related Needs Assessment in the Vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome Population is still open and will be until early December. There is a link in the episode show notes if you'd like to take that survey. The survey is open to people with VEDS and their parents, partners and spouses, and siblings at least 13 years old. Also, if you like this show, you can support it by joining my Patreon. My supporters on Patreon make it possible for me to continue producing this show, and you can join and support the podcast for just a few dollars a month. But whether you support this work through the Patreon or just by sharing it, it all helps. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's get into the show. Hey, Grace, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast to share your story. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself to everybody who doesn't know you? Yes. So I'm Grace. I am in Northern Virginia, and I have Marfan syndrome. I am a patient myself, but I'm also a caregiver to my dad. So I have both the patient and the caregiver aspect of the Marfan world. I have done advocacy for about seven years now. Um, So I've kind of grown up just, you know, sharing my story, making people aware of what Marfan syndrome is, how they can help in the community, things like that. And I'm a college student at Longwood University as a social work major. So it's very fun. That is so awesome. Are you, what year of college are you in? I'm a sophomore. So I've got, I've got some time to go. That is so cool. So let's dive into your story with Marfan syndrome a little bit. You mentioned that you are a caregiver for your dad. What age were you diagnosed with Marfan? I was diagnosed when I was four years old. So we had known that my dad had Marfan syndrome. My dad was diagnosed when he was three. And my mom and dad took me to my normal physic, like pediatrician appointment when I was four. And we noticed some things in my vision. That was the first throw off. They thought that I had a lazy eye. And that was the original like assumption of what was going on. Uh, because I would look at things sideways and point to them in an opposite direction of what the object was actually in. So everybody thought that I was like either messing with them or I had a lazy eye. Turns out I actually had a dislocated lens in my eye. So that was that was the problem. <laughs> and that's pretty common with Marfan patients. But I hadn't been diagnosed yet. And again, we did know my dad had it. And they also looked at my aorta, which was slightly enlarged. It was not dangerous at that point. We haven't gotten there yet, <laughs> knock on wood. But they did notice those, you know, throw offs and they are common in the Marfan world. And considering my dad has it, they were like, we got to get her tested. So we eventually went to Johns Hopkins. I got tested there. And my mom said the doctor walked in. The doctor looked at her and with kind of like the look on the face. And she was like, I just need you to tell me. I'm going to walk out, collect myself, and then we'll have a plan. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. And I also had some blood pressure issues at the time. So they put me on blood pressure meds and I got glasses. Um, And I didn't really start having any issues till about fifth grade is when, you know, things started impacting me a little bit differently. So that was kind of my diagnosis story. And growing up with having my dad having Marfans is a whole other ballgame. You know, not just having me as a patient. But also seeing my dad go through things that can, you know, very, you know, can can really happen to me at any point, which has been an interesting way to grow up. <laughs> yeah. And it's been interesting just kind of seeing how my dad handles things. 
I talk about my story all the time from the caregiver point of view and the patient point of view. And a lot of people are like, oh, how are you so open about it? And like, you know, you're so strong and you have your emotions. So like handled with such a serious thing. And I was like, I honestly think it's just the way that I was kind of raised with having my dad in and out of the hospital. My dad has a full-time job in an office. He's high up in the company. Like you would never know that this person had gone through multiple open heart surgeries, you know, life threatening emergency issues and, you know, struggles with these things on a day-to-day basis. So I think it's just kind of the way that I handle Marfan syndrome has really come from seeing my dad and how he handles things, but it definitely has not always been easy. So that, I mean, there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah, I think let's talk about like your childhood for a minute. You're diagnosed with Marfan syndrome at four. Your dad has known about it your whole life, right? Like he has known about his own diagnosis mm-hmm. for your whole life. And you mentioned all these like, you know, four open heart surgeries and all the other things that he's had to deal with. What was that like for you? Like how much did you know? growing up and how did that feel my parents and i talk about this every now and then of like i wasn't really we don't really remember how my parents told me i had marfans and it was kind of one of these things that like i grew up and the way that my parents would describe things is just be careful because yours and daddy's hearts are kind of similar and it was like growing up it wasn't like i had struggled with these things but i'd seen my dad you know, in and out of the hospital. And I think a big part of growing up with that kind of is like a normal life, right? Like he was in and out of the hospital, but it was kind of like we knew how to handle it. And one of the things that my parents and my family and I always say is it takes a village, especially in the rare disease or the chronic illness community, it takes a village. So growing up, I had, you know, we have our family friends, we have our close family members around us it really was a lot about a, about community. I was an only kid for about seven years until my brother was born, but my dad would be in the hospital for weeks and my mom also had a child, right? So it was kind of like trying to balance. I had chair practice, but dad was in the hospital, but mom had to work, right? Or I had school and then chair practice and then it would go home. But it was like, that was a little different when my dad was in the hospital. So I think as a kid, Seeing him go through those things, it was really about just having that community and that support. And it was scary at times, right? It was scary. There have been a few instances where we haven't known if my dad was going to come home. So that was always kind of, you know, my dad and I are very, very close, but it was scary at times. And my parents were pretty open about my dad's emergency situations and his heart surgeries and whatever else. So I think you know, it scared me and it was different than what my friends had grown up with. But just the way that my family handles things like that, it really is about community and just supporting each other. But then getting older and realizing, oh, wait, I have these same medical condition, right? And it's still, I have the risk of having these things that have happened to my dad can happen to me. And I think one of the things that I struggle with a little bit now that I'm 19 and kind of have a better hold on my life than I did when I was seven (laughs) Um, (laughs) is it's a little challenging, you know, growing up, I go to my cardiologist appointments and we go to Hopkins and I see my dad's cardiologist and I see his appointments happen. And it's like, at some point in my life with Marfians, I am most likely going to have to have an aortic surgery of some kind. It's just the reality And it was always interesting, you know, you're younger and they're like, oh, you'll do it later in life. Like, it'll be down the road. And now it's like, those 10 years have gone by. Like, (laughs) it's like that time that like, oh, it'll be down the road. It'll be down the road. It's like, oh, I'm growing up now. So it's like closer down the road. So I think growing up, I was kind of just blind to it. But as you get older, I think is when it starts to like hit home a little closer that like, Not only my dad has gone through these things, but I can as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that was, you know, the community and the support is really important, especially with a kid seeing that. Yes, for sure. And how do you, like, how do you kind of mentally prepare for something like that? I don't think there's a right or wrong answer for that one. (laughs) 
Um, <laughs> for me, a lot of people have asked me like, oh, are you scared that like something's going to happen out of nowhere? Or, you know, at some point you're going to need this surgery. Does that scare you? And I'm like, well, it's definitely not, you know, not scary, but I also don't like to live every day in fear. I'm 19 years old. I'm off at college. I am a social work major. Like I have these big plans for myself, right? I have these goals. And in my mind, if I were to sit down every day and kind of have this mindset of, oh my gosh, anything can happen at any time, would kind of hold me back. And I think, unfortunately, it is just the reality. And there's nothing that I can do physically to stop that, right? I mean, I can take better care of my body and whatever else, but with Marfan's and, you know, these connective tissue disorders, anything can happen at any time. And I think one of the things that really made me realize that and really was a big, probably a big emotional part in my Marfan journey was my dad had his second aortic dissection just days after my 15th birthday. And it was my dad's second dissection, which was a lot of people don't even make it after the first one. And this was the second one my dad had had. And it was three hours after he had his aorta checked on for his annual appointment. And they were like, all right, you're good. We'll see you in nine months, you know, see you in a year. And he was on his way home from Johns Hopkins after that appointment and dissected on the road. So I think seeing him go through that when he was fine three hours prior was definitely a big emotional thing for me because it's like I could be doing anything and something could happen. Um, so I think you have this this underlying fear or this underlying awareness that something can happen, but I've always had the mindset of if I'm sitting in this fear and this these hard emotions every day, I'm not I'm not going to enjoy life, right? So yeah, it's scary. But I think it's really important to be aware, but also live your life to the fullest. Yeah, it's like a balancing act. And that is so relatable. Like that spontaneity is something that we talk a lot about in the vets community. Yeah. And, you know, we hear the way that Marfan is communicated about a lot. You don't hear as much of that spontaneity, even though that is a reality of having Marfan syndrome. And I love that you brought that up really, I think it's so important to remember that these, that it's not this incredibly predictable condition exactly. all the time. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And one of the things that my parents have always kind of ingrained in me is being aware of my body. One of the things that I deal with as a Marfan patient is I also have costochondritis on top of Marfan's, which is an inflammation of the cartilage in your rib cage. So Basically, my ribs hurt 24-7 <laughs> in, in some way or another. And so that's just kind of a constant pain or uncomfortable feeling that I can manage. And I've learned how to manage over the past couple of years. But I also know when something's not right. Like, I know my costochondritis pains. And then I know if something's really, really wrong. So I think that's really important you know, as a patient with Marfan syndrome or VEDS or whatever else the case might be, is just being extra aware of your body. My dad deals with chronic pain also, but he knew the difference between a chronic pain flare-up and the aortic dissection pain. So I think it's really important to understand those boundaries and those differences so that you can be aware and get to the hospital or get where you need to be with enough time. Yeah. So let's talk about, you know, growing up kind of like knowing about body awareness and kind of knowing that things could happen. You mentioned that your first kind of thing that happened with Marfan, I think, was in fifth grade. Is that right? Yes. So yes. tell me about that. So when I was in fifth grade, I, again, I was diagnosed when I was four and I got glasses pretty much immediately. So I grew up having glasses, It was, but it was pretty normal. I mean, a lot of kids have glasses. And I was in class one day and all of a sudden everything just went blurry. And I ended up going to the clinic and what are they gonna do at the clinic in elementary school, right? Like I was told to lay down, <laughs> here's some mice. And I waited a few days to tell my mom, but I eventually told my mom that I couldn't see for a few days. 
everything just went very blurry and it was different than, you know, I'm tired. So my vision's a little blurry. Like something was like very wrong. And again, I think it's just the way that my parents raised me of like, make sure you're aware of your body, things like that. So fifth grade, we ended up going to about four doctors in one day to try to figure out what the issue was. Because a, another thing that you hear often in the rare disease community is there's nothing wrong. Either she's overreacting or she's stressed or whatever else. But I couldn't see. So that wasn't necessarily the issue. And my mom was done with taking no for an answer and took me to one of my dad's eye surgeons. And he looked at me for about 20 minutes and said, yeah, her lens has shifted more. So our two options here are to replace her lens or just re remove it. So about a month later, we ended up removing my lenses in both eyes. And that was definitely challenging. I was in fifth grade at the time and I had a surgery that I was recovering from, but I wanted to be at school hanging out with my friends. Um, and it was just, it was definitely challenging. And then going back to school, and unfortunately, kids are going to say mean things no matter what the situation is. And that was something that I think I struggled with a little more as I got older. Kids start to make more comments as you get older. And it was one of these things that's like, you know, in gym class for a lot of these activities, I would sit like on the wall, right? While the other kids were in gym class doing the activity and kids are curious, kids want to know. So they come up to you and they ask you all these questions and Again, I grew up kind of being aware of my body and spreading awareness and telling my story. But I think as a kid, it's also very important to understand that you don't owe everybody an explanation. Mm -hmm. It's okay to be like, I just don't feel good or I'm just sitting down. So I think one of the things is like, especially growing up and being younger, you don't want to be embarrassed, but it's also important that you do make sure that you are aware because being in pain is going to be worse than being embarrassed. <laughs> um, and I think it's, it's just important. And I'm glad that I was kind of raised in a way that I was aware of my body, but I also knew my boundaries physically and emotionally when telling my story. And then by sixth grade is when the chronic pain started. And that's a whole other ball game. And it took about four ER visits for the doctors to tell me that I wasn't just stressed. <laughs> I wasn't just overreacting. And I think Marfan parents and chronic pain, chronic illness parents react to things very differently. My dad is a patient. So he's very like, oh, it could be nothing or it could be something. And my mom's very mama bear and very, we need to figure out what's going on because this could be really, really, really bad. So I think in the hospitals, especially, I try to tell doctors, like, I understand that you don't understand everything about Marfan's because it is rare and it's not the top of, you know, the list of things. But I think it's really important for doctors to also understand that, especially as a kid, like, this kid might not just be stressed. Like, yeah. it's, it, it's probably more beyond that. <laughs> and just because you can't really find an answer right away doesn't mean that there's not something wrong. Yeah. What was your pain? What was your, like, where was your pain? What did it feel like? And what did it end up being? So when my chronic pain started, it started in my back. And it was just, it felt like pressure pain, but very immediate. It wasn't like a gradual pain. It was just very like sudden. That's the scariest pain. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That's, that's <laughs> yes. what threw my mom off. That's what threw my mom off was we were literally shopping and all of a sudden I was like oh my god my back hurts so 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 bad and I literally started crying and sat on the floor of Nordstrom Rack <laughs> because oh I was my, yeah and so my mom we leave the store we get in the car she's calling my dad and she's like I might just have her like go home and rest but even that like 10 minute drive home I was just in like excruciating pain so we ended up going into the ER they ran a bunch of tests and we basically did that four times because I kept having these like flare ups, but we didn't know what was going on. And eventually I went to the ER and they were like, oh yeah, you have costochondritis. And it was to the point where they didn't need a CT or an MRI or a CAT, like any of the scans to actually see the inflammation. They could just press down and feel how inflamed my rib cage 
was, which is when we knew, like, see, she's not just stressed. Like, <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think, you know, chronic pain is a whole issue in itself. Everybody manages pain differently. And one of the things that I struggled with was, you know, my dad has these really big emergencies happen to the point where usually it's emergency surgery. Costochondritis, you can't fix with surgery. So the amount of times I've told doctors, like, is there not, like, I would rather have a surgery than have years of pain, mm -hmm. which is not something that most kids would say. But, you know, you're, you're in so much pain, you feel very hopeless and just there's nothing that you can do and nobody's listening to you and whatever else. So I think as a kid, it was challenging because one, I just wanted my body to feel normal, right? I wanted to be in class and not be in pain, not have to stretch every five minutes, right? And then just figuring out how you manage your pain, because again, everyone manages it differently. And sometimes your tricks will wear off and you got to figure out something new. There's the medication game where you got to make sure your aortic meds and your blood pressure meds work with your pain meds and whatever else. So I think chronic pain in itself is a whole, whole different ball game, especially as a kid, you feel kind of helpless and nobody understands it. And it's, it's challenging. Yeah. When did you start getting involved in the community and meeting other people outside of your family with Marfan that you could relate to? I actually met my first, not my first Marfan person beyond my father was Maya Zimmerman and we love Maya. And it was really cool because there's a Facebook groups and my mom was all on the Facebook groups. And Maya was at Johns Hopkins and we had, it was like the same weekend or the same couple of days we had appointments with the same doctor. And it was kind of one of those opportunities. It was like, there's more Marfian people in the world. And it's just, it's so cool having that community. So we ended up like meeting them at Johns Hopkins in the waiting room. It was so great. And it was just, we met her and we met her son who also has Marfans. And it was really interesting because I got to see how different Marfans was. You know, growing up, I saw the heart issues. I saw the aortic issues. And then, you know, I had my chronic pain, but I hadn't seen or understood that there was a lung side to this, to this illness and that there was joints and all these other issues. So I think it was really interesting just kind of seeing other patients beyond my dad and I to kind of understand the disease a little bit better, but also be like, there's more of us. Like even doctors sometimes don't get it, right? Because again, it, we're not at the top of the priority list, <laughs> but I think it was just so cool seeing other people who had Marfans who were living their lives and spreading awareness and things like that. My first conference was in Baltimore, and that was amazing. I mean, I got to meet kids, which I think was amazing. I think as a kid, it's important to understand Marfans physically, but also to have that community beyond the actual illness um, and kind of have just that community and have those friendships that you can kind of like lean on um, and support each other, but just know that you're not alone. And I think that was such a cool thing at my age. I was still in elementary school and I'm still like amazing friends with some of those people that I met at my very first conference. So I, I went to conferences and then during my eye surgery recovery, uh, I was like, some other kid has this worse than I do. I've been lucky enough that I've only had my eye surgery so far, but I know that there were kids out there who were having open heart surgeries and having these more complex issues, but they weren't being looked at at all. Because again, it's a rare disease. So why are we going to pay attention to that? And it's like, wait a minute, like these kids are going through some serious things. And I told my mom and dad that I wanted to help those kids, but I didn't know how, and I didn't know what that meant. And it took me about a year and a half, <laughs> but I eventually got a project started called Marfan Friends. And Marfan Friends sends care packages called friend packs to kids in the hospital with Marfans and other rare disease with, you know, chronic rare connective tissue disorder diseases and just kind of, you know, sheds light on the fact that there's other 
issues beyond the number one looked at diseases like cancer and things like that. Like there are kids who have Marfans and VEDs and things like that who are struggling just as much. You need just as much support and love. And I think that that was something that just, it, it, that was my first big, I'm going to help the community. Well, how old were you then when you started doing that? So by the time I got it going, I was in sixth grade. It was right after sixth grade. So I was 13, I believe. Yeah, I was about 13 when I finally got my first okay. friend back out. And it, it's not easy when you're 13. <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> um, but it, it was really cool because I got to create even more relationships and bonds with families, not just the patients, but the families as well. Because I think it really is important to look at the caregiver's just as much because mm -hmm. the caregivers run the show. <laughs> they really do. Whether you're a doctor, whether you're a patient or a parent, a spouse, like the caregivers really are amazing. But it was just really cool to be able to help people and share my story, but also just connect with those other families who are struggling as well. And I started again, speaking at conferences. So I would do like the teen panels where mm -hmm. parents would get to ask the teenagers how to kind of do it, right? What did your parent, how did your parents raise you having Marfians, right? What are things that you wish were done differently or you would want me to share with my kid or whatever else? And I think connecting not only with the teens, but also their parents is just as important. And then I started doing lobbying on Capitol Hill. So I did that twice. And I think within my community and my service work with the Marfian and rare disease community is it started as sending gifts and care packages to kids, but now it's making more, I'm trying to make more of a difference beyond just the Marfian community, right? Lobbying on Capitol Hill can help in so many aspects of life for the rare disease community, not just the support, but also the funding and the awareness and the education and things like that. That was, that was an amazing opportunity. And then I was a keynote speaker for Booz Allen Hamilton, which is a government contracting firm in DC. Um, and that was a really cool opportunity because I got to go beyond just rare diseases, but I got to say, okay, I am a young adult, still a teenager with a disability. And I got to reach out to not only the physical disabilities, but the intellectual disabilities, the learning disabilities, things like that, and be like, look, I have a rare physical disability, but I live my life to the fullest, right? I am a college student. I want to get my master's and become a social worker, right? Like I have these goals for myself and I, I have to work hard for that. And we all do, but kind of making people aware that just because you have this setback or this disadvantage that some people might look at, you really can do so much in the world beyond having this disability. So I think that's probably one of my favorite things about the work that I do and the service community work that I do is just the fact that I started just working with the Marfian community, but beyond that so much. And it's just kind of being able to make that difference for, my, for other people is just amazing. Yeah, I really am so... I'm very impressed by your advocacy work that you've done. I mean, you're 19 years old and you've done, I mean, you just listed off so many things that you've been yeah. involved in, you know, and I know it doesn't stop there. Right. It's and it's so, <laughs> so cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah no, like great job. Yeah. It's amazing. It, it really is seeing the faces on people when you get to have those bonds and then you meet those people in person, right? Cause there's, Marfan patients all over. And I think one of my favorite things is, I mean, one of my best friends, the other Grace, the other Marfan Grace, she lives in Michigan and her and I literally talked online for two years. And then we met in Georgia and it was like the best thing ever. And now I talk to her like every day and <laughs> we, I saw her this past summer. I went to go visit her in Michigan. Like you form these bonds and these relationships through your illness, but it goes beyond that. And now you're like family. And it's just, it really is incredible seeing the work and all that pay off. 
Yeah. It's seeing the work pay off and it's that like the connections that people make, you know, and so like you connect with somebody and then somebody else connects with somebody and then each of those people, you know, they create such a bigger thing. Like we all can do so much together and that's always been really real. I mean, that's what's like part of, I think what you're talking about is this kind of like that snowball of advocacy and awareness and connection and how that brings everybody together into it. It's awesome. No, I love it. I think it's really important to just like understand that Marfians and having a rare disease is not easy, but having that community that does understand that can kind of relate with you, but also give different tips and tricks on how they've, how they've done it. Right. Maya is a big inspiration for me because I, it, it hasn't always been easy. And Maya is definitely somebody that I've like looked at and been like, you've gone through it and she'll give me tips and different points to look at it from. And I think it's just really incredible to have that, that community. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. Totally. And I love Maya too. (laughs) Shout out to Maya. (laughs) If you haven't listened to, if you're listening to this and you haven't listened to Maya's episode, I really encourage you to go back and listen to her episode too. She's fantastic. So, If you were talking, you're 19 now, you've known about Marfan pretty much the majority of your probably memorable life. Mm -hmm. Um, What advice would you have for a kid or a teen kind of grappling with life with Marfan? One of the things that I tell parents and teenagers is, you know, it's, it's not easy, right? And a lot of times I do have this strong hold on my emotions with it all because it's the reality, but it hasn't always been easy. And I think it's important to touch on the difficult emotional parts just as much as the good days. But I think it really is important to connect with that community. And, you know, the the papers that they hand you when you're first diagnosed are scary. It's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot of big words that you don't want to hear. But I think it's really important to um, understand your disease, your disorder from the medical point of view, but also to be aware of like, look, this, this is a reality, but kind of having a life beyond Marfan's, right? Awareness is a major part of my life. I tell not a single person in my life who's my friend, my family, whatever else does not like is, is aware of Marfan's. Everybody's aware of it. They ask me questions. I talk about it all the time. Um, I have a tattoo for Marfan awareness. Like I talk about it all the time. It's a major part of my life, but it's not my whole life. One of the things that I do every year is on rare disease day, I do a presentation. I do a PowerPoint on rare diseases. And the first thing that I start with is, hi, I'm Grace. I'm a social work major at Longwood University. I'm a big sister. I want to be a military social worker. I'm a big ice hockey fan. I also have Marfan syndrome. So like, there's more to you beyond your disability or your disorder or Marfan's or whatever. Like there's more beyond that. And I think that that's one of the most important things is, you know, just being aware that it's not, it doesn't have to be your whole life. It's an important part, but there's life beyond Marfan's. And I think it's important to look at some of the amazing Um, stories within the community, right? My dad's had so many different emergencies that he, his doctors have have said multiple times, we don't know how you're still here, but here he is. So I think it's important to look at, you know, the hardships, but also be aware that there is hope and there are miracles that happen. That's something another person on the show has come on and talked about. I cannot remember the words that she used, but it was so impactful. She was talking about the impact that it can have on your psyche when doctors are constantly telling you like you're not going to make it or there's a chance that you're not going to make it or we don't think you're going to make it and you just like continue to say goodbye and she's still here, right? And your dad is still here. What was that experience like? Like, is that the way that it happened for you, for, for him and for you or... For me, it was, I think it was just seeing my dad 
go through some crazy things. My most memorable emergency was when I, my brother's baby shower, my mom and I had to leave in the middle of the shower because my dad was bleeding internally. And that was due to a complication from a hernia. So I think, I think for me, it was just kind of one of those things that like, you know, things happen with the, in the Marfian world. And my dad was in and out of the hospital for, I mean, probably two years with infections, bleeding, surgeries. Eventually he had an abdominal reconstruction surgery and my dad's aorta is completely fake. It's all been redone, <laughs> remodeled. And I think it's, you grow up and you see those things. And, you know, again, I have, we have thought multiple times that my dad wouldn't make it, but my dad's outlook on it is very incredible. And I think that I've had it a little bit, maybe a little bit easier than people who don't have a, the parent who also has it, just because I have gotten to see my dad bounce back like he has and have a good outlook on things. So I think understanding that there are the risks has been challenging at times, but again, my dad is still here and he's still pushing. So that's, that's my reality is if I have a dissection, I'm going to make it. <laughs> but I think that's, again, it's just the way that I was raised and the way that I've seen my dad bounce back has really helped me. Yeah. I love that. And I've, I've always been so floored by the connections between like kids with either VADS or Marfan and their parents who also have the condition. I really think that's such a beautiful, it's a beautiful connection. And I think it's a really important connection it that is. They can just really impact the way that you move through life and have somebody with the condition kind of to lean on for, for that kind of experience, you know? Definitely. Yeah. So we're nearing the end of our time together here. I want to ask you if there's a medical professional listening to this podcast in all of your 19 years of life with Marfan syndrome and your experiences growing up with it and having a parent with it, seeing your dad go through everything, having friends in the community, what is the top thing that you want medical professionals to know, either about life with Marfan or Marfan itself? Yeah, so I think one of the big things is one of the things that I, I helped with two summers ago in California was we lost a Marfan patient in the young adults community days before conference. And we had a little memorial at the beach for her. And one of her doctors was there and asked me that question. Hey, I'm a doctor and I kind of want to hear, you know, is there advice that I could use for future patients? And I said, well, I think it's really important that you make them aware of the risks and what Marfan's really is, but that you also make sure that there is support in place and you're not just handing them this packet of scary information, but maybe you have a Marfan patient. And I gave her my info. I was like, if there's a teenager or a kid or a family who got this news, please give them my contact information because it's hard, right? Getting that news is hard. And there, it, there really isn't a way to sugarcoat it. It's hard. But I think it's really important to have that community and have it from the from the very, very start. I got involved with the community when I was like 13, 12 or 13. And it's been amazing. And I think just getting that on the, on the very beginning of the Marfan journey is just so important. So as a professional, I think if you're a specialist, like make sure you're involved, right? My doctors at Hopkins they go to conferences and they are involved in the community. And I think that's really incredible. But I think one of the things that a lot of Marfan patients struggle with is, you know, the hospitals and the doctors that just aren't as aware. I have been going through some different lung issues recently. And I went to the hospital about two months ago and the doctor was like, well, I just don't know what, what to do. So like, here's some meds, like go home and rest. And it's like, that's just not what I want to hear. Like, I understand that there's little information and there's little awareness, but at a whole other point, it's like, can you at least give me a better answer or have somebody else come in that might be a little bit more aware, right? I think it's a lot better for doctors to say, hey, I don't really know what to do in this situation. Let me find you somebody who does, 
as opposed to nothing's wrong with you. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big part of it is like, I understand that you want to get educated as much as possible, I hope, but there's so many other issues, but I think it really, really is important to just understand that this isn't just a medical condition. This is, there's a lot of emotions around it. So I think making sure that you're cautious around the emotions is also just as important as giving them medical answers. (laughs) I love that. Yeah, I think that's so, it's so relatable and so true and so, so, so important. Like so often we hear that, you know, people get, they just get a paragraph of information printed off the internet and, you know, you end it off like go live your life. And, exactly. and it's like, how are you supposed to cope with this information? I, I love that you gave your information to that doctor to say like anytime you have somebody you know feel free to connect them I think it's fantastic yeah of course it's because again it it really is it takes a village (laughs) like I said it takes a village and getting that news is scary I talked to someone in California and their son was just diagnosed and the dad was like the packet is scary and I was like I get it right like I understand that but I think it really is important and just amazing that they're already at a conference, right? I mean, this kid was like running around having a great time with other kids who could who understood. And his parents were with parents who understood. So I think, again, the medical information is just as important. Please listen to your doctors. But um, the, the community is, is just as, if not more important. Yeah, that's critical. Thank you so much for coming on to the show and sharing your story, oh. Grace. Thank you for having me. It was amazing. Thanks for listening to this episode featuring Grace Barnhart sharing her story with Marfan syndrome. There are lots of helpful links in the episode show notes if you're ready to meet others, get involved, or just need support. On Saturday, we'll talk to Allison Pullins, whose son James has Marfan syndrome. If you like this show, I hope you will consider sharing it with your friends on social media, which helps us raise awareness of these conditions together. And you can also support the production of this show by joining my Patreon. Thanks so much, and I'll see you soon.